Yes, hi everyone, my name is Nick. Uh, so we're going to be doing an equip class on the message of the Bible today. Um, so what we're going to do first, um, just a warm-up question, maybe discuss with your neighbour, um, introduce yourself if you, haven't, if you don't know each other, and uh, answer the question, how will you summarise the Bible in one sentence? Maybe you can hear from behind one of the sentences you'll have. Okay, God's plan to save his people. Um, Agnes, your group? Yeah, hey, choose one of them that you all have. God's word um, that reveals about his character. Reveals about his character? Okay. Uh, John or Jeremy? Same? Same? Like same? That story on how people will be saved. Okay, yeah, God's story on how people will be saved. That's all, I think these are all very good uh, summaries. Um, the challenge is really uh, capturing the diversity of scripture, right? Because you have scripture that is very diverse, from stories to poetry to uh, yeah, just proverbs on everyday life, right? Any summary, you're going to leave out some things. Um, so, uh, one way that uh, we try to have a unified message of the Bible is like these ideas of salvation, kingdom, uh, yeah, God's plan. These are the kind of ideas that we look at. Uh, but we also correct to think of the Bible as having one unified message. Uh, this is one book. Right? In the past, it didn't like wasn't compiled this way, and uh, like how we see it today, uh, because it has one author. That's why we can see it as one book, and that one author is God. It's not like a library where you have like sixty six different books on a shelf that are all written by different people. It's one book. So because there's uh, one author, you are right to see it as having one message. And today, the message that we're going to consider is that the Bible is about oh, hi, you see, uh, it's about how God establishes His kingdom through His covenants. Okay, so that's the first line. The Bible is about how God establishes His kingdom through His covenants. Uh, I'll say it one more time. The Bible is about how God establishes His kingdom through His covenants. It is, uh, the S at the end on covenants is intentional, so it's plural covenants. Wow, we have more than we've fulfilled. Great. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, there are some chairs, but I will power through. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there's a header sentence. The Bible is about how God establishes His kingdom through His covenants. We're going to break that sentence down first into its three components. You see one, two, three there. God, kingdom, and covenants. So first, God. Right? God is the main character of the Bible. Right? Just think about how the Bible begins. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God. Right? It's not in the beginning, humans. It's not in the beginning, the devil. Right? It's beginning, God. So God is the main character of the Bible. Uh, we are humans, and we do well to read and understand the Bible. But one of the most important things to know is that it's not primarily about us. Right? The Bible is not primarily about us humans. It's a book about God. So when we see the things, when you see the Bible this way, we will pause before rushing to think about how a specific passage applies to us. Right? We will see first how it relates to God and His kingdom before applying it to us. So that's the second element, kingdom. And what do I mean by kingdom? Uh, simply put, God is the king of the universe. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. So God is king. But what did humanity do? Humanity rebelled against God's kingdom at the fall. So this resulted in death. And to make things right, God has to save humanity from death and thereby establish his kingdom. The reason why God saves humanity is to establish his kingdom. Now the third element is covenants. So covenants is probably the least familiar word in, among these three. Covenants are formal commitments of faithfulness and trust between two parties. Uh, a human kind of covenant is like marriage, but God also establishes covenants with us. Uh, after the fall, right, which we talked about earlier when humanity rebelled against God, a saviour is promised in Genesis 3.15. Right? And this saviour's identity is given greater clarity. Right? We get to see more clearly who this person is through God's covenants. Through God's covenants, God commits his faithfulness to save his people 
and establish his kingdom. Right? These formal commitments is how he establishes his kingdom. So the covenants form the structure of the Bible. Okay? It's a bit like uh, the spine on each of us. Right? The spine sort of holds us together. The covenants, in a, in a similar way, holds the Bible together. When we see uh, the different covenants, that's sort of our macro structure of the Bible. Right? And importantly, the progressive revelation of these covenants, so each covenant gives greater and greater clarity, right, will show how God's promises find their fulfillment in Christ. Right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, God made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. To unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So these covenants like slowly show us uh, how these all will be fulfilled in Christ. Okay, so the Bible is about how God establishes his kingdom through his covenants. So then for the next 50 odd minutes, we'll unpack this sentence by examining each biblical covenant. Okay, so you'll see the big hand uh, the underlined headers of the handout will be each of the covenants, right? And then after that, we will show how they point to Christ and His church. So the hope for this session is that this will give all of us a framework right, to help us to situate different texts in the Bible right, within uh, this framework to help us in our interpretation. The subsequent, uh, series, uh, sorry, the subsequent sessions in this Equip series will give us specific interpretive tools when we meet each text. But for now, we are going to look at the big picture before we zoom in in the subsequent sessions. So, uh, may I pause for a moment? Any questions about this before we start with the first covenant? Okay, great. Then we'll begin with the creation covenant. So, that's the first header. Right. So, uh, this is found in Genesis 1 to 2. Genesis 1 to 2. Maybe the first thought you might be thinking, uh, if you are familiar with Genesis 1 to 2, is that the word covenant doesn't appear in Genesis 1 to 2. So Nick, why are you saying that there's a covenant here? Right. Uh, so my response is that the text suggests that there is a covenant here. So remember how covenants are formal commitments of faithfulness between two parties. And actually, in biblical covenants, there's usually, not always, but usually, a representative. And this is exactly what we see in Genesis 1 to 2. God promises Adam, the representative of humanity in this covenant, eternal life upon perfect obedience and death upon disobedience. So you see how God begins to establish his kingdom. He commands humans, his image bearers, to have dominion or to rule over creation on God's behalf. So God is king and God asks humans, his image bearers, to rule over creation and that's how God begins to establish his kingdom uh, in the creation covenant. Uh, two other texts in scripture also mention uh, this covenant. So we're going to write down Hosea 6 verse 7. Hosea 6 verse 7. It says, But like Adam, they, in this case, uh, Hosea refers to Israel. So, but like Adam, Israel transgressed the covenant. There, Israel dealt faithlessly with me. In this case, it means God. So Hosea seems to suggest that there was a covenant that Adam transgressed. Uh, the other text would be Jeremiah thirty-three nineteen. So this mentions God's covenant with the day and his covenant with the night. This also suggests that God made a covenant with creation, day and night. <coughs> Hence, there is a good reason to see a covenant made between God and creation with Adam as his representative. They may be like, okay, uh, sure, like this, this covenant here, why is this important? <coughs> the creation covenant is very important because it's foundational for all subsequent covenants. Right? It lays a foundation. Right? We mentioned earlier how Adam fell, humanity fell, rebelled against God's kingdom, and this resulted in death. This was him breaking the covenant, which we saw described in Hosea 6-7. But God promised a future saviour. Genesis 3-15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and shall bruise his heel. This is God promising that he will destroy Satan through a savior. So all subsequent covenant representatives, which we'll see in the rest of the session, are subsets of Adam in a way. Right? They are dim lights 
of this promised savior. They play the role that Adam was supposed to, but they ultimately fail until the true promised savior arrives. Hope you all see how the creation covenant is foundational for subsequent covenants. There's still some chance there, right? Okay. All right, y'all can settle that. Okay. So the creation covenant is foundational for subsequent covenants. Is that going on? Any questions about the creation covenant? Okay. Cool. All right. Then we will go to the Noahic covenant. Okay. Let's we continue the story of the Bible. Right. Remember what happened? Uh, God establishes His kingdom through the creation covenant. His representative is Adam, but Adam fell. He rebelled against uh, God in the event known to us as the fall. So, and God, uh, uh, sorry, and humanity's sin continues even after the fall. And God responds with the flood. Right. Humanity and all of creation is almost wiped out. Uh, it's almost like a reset on creation. And maybe you might ask, how then would God use humanity to establish his kingdom as he wanted to at the start? So now, uh, maybe in pairs, or threes if you prefer, uh, read Genesis uh, 9, 1 to 7 and compare it to Genesis 1, 26 to 30, and then the handout. Uh, look at their similarities and differences and maybe try and think, uh, if you can, what do they tell you about this covenant? This, this covenant being the Noahic covenant. For those who just joined us, I'll, I'll just give the most important sentence, which is the one that you should remember from this session. The first line, the Bible is about how God establishes his kingdom through his covenants. The Bible is about how God establishes his kingdom through his covenants. So we look at the first covenant, the creation covenant. Now we're looking at the Noahic covenant. Uh, so yeah, maybe different groups. Um, Isaac, your group. Uh, they all manage to spot any similarities and differences between Genesis nine and Genesis one. Uh, so some of the differences is about like talking about murder, the life. Blood. Mm, mm. So uh, Uncle Kevin was saying like maybe it's about kosher and all something. Okay. Okay. That's but life. yeah, yeah, that's good. Like there's this. That's fine, yeah. There's this idea of death, which is like overshadowing this, not overshadowing, it's in the context of this Noahic covenant. Good. Anyone spotted the similarities? Actually, sorry, say again. Be fruitful and multiply. multiply. Yeah, those are very important words. Uh, You all see the word bless as well. So those are similarities, right? The blessing, uh, the same commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Right? So there are very similar um, commandments, but there are also stark differences. Right? So as uh, Uncle Kaiman mentioned, uh, there's death. Uh, creation fears Noah. He can eat animals. Earlier, Adam and Eve actually couldn't. He still eat plants only. Uh, from Noah onwards, he can eat animals. And God also doesn't reverse the curse of death. Right? He seems to be stipulating principles to live in the reality of death. So in other words, right, to summarize that, the Noahic Covenant is a renewal of the Creation Covenant. The Noahic Covenant is a renewal of the Creation Covenant. This is in a post-fall, sin-stained world. One of the authors that I've referenced a lot, he describes this as the renewed arena in which God's subsequent covenants will be played out. So it's like, okay, you did a reset, I had a flood, reset everything, now this is how things are going to play out. This is how God will continue to establish his kingdom through humanity. One important implication um, is that the Noahic covenant shows that God's kingdom is established for all humanity. All humanity, not just his chosen people. So this means that non-believers, our friends and family members, are accountable to God through the Noahic covenant as well. How they help to establish God's kingdom, they are accountable to it. Uh, to God through this. Okay, so that's a Noahic covenant. Now we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant. So page two of the handout. So continue the story. After the Noahic covenant is made, generations pass. Um, human sin and rebellion still persist though. Noah himself was found to be drunk and showing that he also failed. Uh, this climaxes in the Tower of Babel, 
uh, with ultimate sin that uh, God judges. Yet generations after that, God chooses one man, his name is Abraham, and his family, and God makes a covenant with him, the representative. So we're going to do the exercise again. Uh, so in bold, uh, compare the two passages again. This time I just zoomed in on one particular verse in Genesis 1. Right, so try and find again their similarities and differences. And what do they tell you about this covenant, about the Abrahamic covenant? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, what do you all see to be similarities and differences? Uh, I think the little girl pointed out that in Genesis 1, it's like Abraham and Sarah and Abraham and Sarah. Mm. But for Genesis 12 and 17, the audience is different to Abraham and mm. his offspring. Yeah, it's great, right? Because there are other humans around, right? not just Adam, not just Noah after the flood. But it's, it's, there are other humans, but he just focuses on Abraham. Okay, good, then we'll talk about that in a bit. Anything else that you all know? Similarity or difference, maybe uh, Jeremy or John? Similarity. Mm-hmm. Similarities is, uh, I guess, in both, both uh, the covenants is that he may just ask them to multiply. Mm. Uh, but in Abraham's covenant, Abraham covenant, God tells him that I will multiply you. Yeah. Supposed to previously, it's like, saying, go for a month by, by now, God is kind of saying, like, uh, I will make sure this happens. Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, both have a blessing, right? But there's a difference, as uh, Jeremy mentioned. In Genesis 1, humanity was told to multiply and told to be fruitful. Here, God promises that he will multiply them, he will make them fruitful. Uh, verse 6 in Genesis 17. So, uh, how do you summarize that? The Abrahamic covenant promises what the creation covenant commands. The Abrahamic covenant promises what the creation covenant commands. Uh, and to pick up on what uh, Agnes was saying, from Joel, uh, instead of wiping out sinful humanity as God did in the flood, right, God allows other humans to exist as nations, and He chooses one person as a special pe- uh, representative, and His descendants will be that special people as an instrument for blessing for other nations. Right, so the Abrahamic covenant is how God will fulfill His promises for humanity. Right, the seed that we saw in Genesis three will come from Abraham's line. So the Abrahamic covenant is a narrowing of the creation covenant to one family. Okay, so at first, it's like all of humanity. Now, we are narrowing down to one family, Abraham's family. So this family will also be an instrument of blessing for many nations. Right, if you all catch that phrase, Abraham will be the father of many nations. But this is not to say that there are no obligations on Abraham and his descendants' part. Right. Genesis 17 verse 1 says that Abraham is to walk before God and be blameless right. Abraham ultimately fails to meet this demand and this tension between God keeping his promises to bless <coughs> excuse me, and demanding full obedience from his covenant partner will only be resolved later in the true promise seed okay. but that's the Abrahamic covenant overview so let's fast forward the tape now Right, uh, we have the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. Um, eventually, they found themselves in slavery in Egypt, and God rescued them in the Exodus, the great redemptive event of the Old Testament. Moses, their leader, mediates the Israelite covenant and spends most of the second half of Exodus to Deuteronomy. It's like three and a half books of the Bible. Uh, this is usually called, maybe you all usually hear of this being called the Mosaic covenant. Right? Uh, I don't really like that term. Because Moses is not a representative. Uh, he's not like Abraham and Noah. Right? Uh, God gives a, a, co- a commandment to Abraham and to Noah. But he doesn't really tell Moses to do these things. He's supposed to because he's part of Israel. But he's not told to do them more so than the rest. He's more of a mediator. Right? So it's not, I don't like to call it the Mosaic Covenant. I prefer to call it the Israelite Covenant. Okay, so... Um, we're going to read passages in Exodus 2 and 3 right before God brings them out of Egypt. Right? So read them and see how God describes himself prior to making the Israelite covenant and what does this tell you about his relationship to the other covenants. Um, what do you all see um, to be how God describes himself? Mm, well, he is, he is um, the God of Isaac, uh, Abraham, mm. uh, Isaac and Jacob. Mm, great. Um, Good boy. Any others? Uh, what, what do you think it tells you about his relationship? 
this Israelite covenant's relationship to the other covenants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The past and the present. Yeah. Uh, great, Agnes. Uh, Exodus two twenty four, particularly, right? God remembered His covenant with Abraham, right? So we see that God delivers Israel out of Egypt and establishes a covenant with them because of the Abrahamic covenant, right? So it's because of the Abrahamic covenant, faithful to that. Therefore, okay, I'm still going to bless y'all. Y'all are in slavery, but y'all are still going to be uh, my chosen people. And he makes this Israelite covenant and he further narrows down the Abrahamic covenant from Abraham's descendants to the nation of Israel. So remember earlier we saw for the Abrahamic covenant, right, there is the narrowing of the creation covenant. Right? Remember there were like other humans, but God chose Abraham and his descendants to be the people he makes the covenant with. In the Israelite covenant, he narrows it even further. Right? The promised seed, remember the Genesis 3.15 seed that we keep looking for right, to make everything right, he will come from this particular nation, from the nation of Israel. Not their cousins, not the Edomites, not the Ishmaelites. Right? Those are also related to Abraham. They are also Abraham's descendants. But it's through the one nation of Israel that the promised seed will come. So God's kingdom is established through Israel in the Israelite covenant. Uh, we, want, we aren't going to read through the Israelite covenant because it's really too long but you, you're going to see if you all read the second half of Exodus to Deuteronomy a lot of laws a lot of things about sacrificial systems a lot about, a lot about life in the land um, these function to define how Israel was to relate to God as he dwelt in their midst right? so they can function as a kingdom of priests Exodus 19.6 and this way they can bless other nations right? which is a promise in the Abrahamic covenant if you all remember how um, the descendants of Abraham will be a blessing to other nations. Uh, these institutions, like the priesthood, uh, the sacrificial system, they also point forward to the great high priest who secures full forgiveness. Uh, and Yanadi will speak more about these connections next week. So come back next week if you want to know more about that. Um, we're going to think a bit about um, the purpose of the Israelite covenant now. Uh, thankfully, the New Testament gives us um, some hints as to this. So if you go to Romans 5, verse 20 to 21, uh, maybe, who is, uh, who is most there? Ashley, can you read for us? Romans 5, verse 20 to 21. Sorry, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks, Ashley. Um, there's a lot of other things in this, but I want to focus on what Paul tells us about the Israelite covenant. Uh, here he refers to it as the law. And so he tells us that the Israelite covenant was made so that it might reveal and intensify sin. And the, it's not just for that sake. It's to prepare God's people for the coming Redeemer, right? Jesus Christ our Lord. So this tells us also that the Israelite covenant anticipated the new covenant. Right? The Israelite covenant anticipated the new covenant, or it's an anticipation of the new covenant. You can put it in a noun form. And this new covenant will be instituted by Christ, as we know as Christians. So again, while God keeps his promise to bless Israel, the Israelite covenant came with many stipulations. Some Jewish scholars number this to 613 laws. It's a lot of laws to keep. Uh, and once again, through this, we see the tension between God's unfailing commitment to keep his promises to his people and his covenant's partner's inability to obey. Israel continually fails to keep God's covenants, sorry, God's commandments. Uh, this starts from the golden calf outside the land to Canaanite gods in the land that they worship. And their hearts continually flee to worthless idols. Um, okay, so before we go to the Davidic covenant next, any questions, uh, clarifications? If you all didn't catch anything, can ask again. Okay, can ask me afterwards also. So where are we? We are in the state of, we understand there's Israel, it's a nation, 
uh, but uh, Israel is faithless. They continually flee to worthless idols. So in light of this, God makes yet another covenant, and this time with King David, uh, after he has established his kingship in Israel. So if you all oh, know the story of uh, Samuel, right, there was the first King Saul, uh, who was rejected by God, and then God establishes David's kingship. And then at this point, uh, in 2 Samuel 7, he makes a covenant with David. Many have said that this is the climax of the Old Testament. Okay, so you all read through these five verses in 2 Samuel, verses 12 to 16, and I answer the question. Uh, um, before we answer the question, actually, I want to point out something. So, uh, you all just read five verses, but even the whole chapter and its parallel text in 1 Chronicles 17, there's a very important word that is missing, which is covenant. Right. In, in 2 Samuel 7, in 1 Chronicles, sorry, 1 Chronicles 17, the word covenant doesn't appear. Right. So like the creation covenant, right, we saw earlier, the co- word covenant doesn't appear in the text. But similar to that one, there are other passages in the Bible that refer to this as a covenant. So for example, 2 Samuel 23, 5. Right. So hopefully this helps you, this convinces you that there is a creation covenant. I think most of you are uh, convinced that there is a Davidic covenant. Okay, so um, through whom will God establish his kingdom in the Davidic covenant? Uh, Dini and... Sorry, I didn't catch her name. <laughs> John, sorry. David's offspring. Yeah, David's offspring. So God establishes his kingdom through David's offspring. And that's the, he's a party... The, the, the David's offspring is a party of this covenant. So there's another narrowing uh, of the Israelite covenant. So the Israel has... 12 tribes, right? Judah is one of the 12 tribes, and Judah has many different people in that tribe. But of all the people, God chose David and his offspring to be uh, the people through whom he will establish uh, his kingdom. Okay, so we've narrowed down further down to David's line in the Davidic covenant. Also note how God describes God's relationship with David's offspring. So 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Right? This sonship language, uh, we didn't read these passages, but was previously applied to Israel as a whole. God used to call Israel uh, his son, like Exodus 4, 22-23, Hosea 11, 1. But now this sonship language is narrowed down to David's offspring. So the Davidic king himself becomes the true Israel. Right? So Israel is embodied in the Davidic king. He represents God's rule to his people and he represents his people to God. Right? This is why if you read the book of Kings, 1 and 2 Kings, they repeatedly assess each king. Right? Uh, this king was good, this king was bad, this king was good, but, this king was bad, but. Right? As the king goes, so goes the nation. So we've seen how Genesis 3.15, right? Remember that's sort of the thing that we've been holding on to all this while. Like God's plan was always to restore humanity via this one offspring of the woman. Right? The Davidic covenant reveals that this will occur through the Davidic king. Right? So we see in the Psalms, right, they describe the Davidic son as having universal rule right, over all the nations, which is kind of strange, right? Like you think that the Davidic king is just over Israel, but it's because he is the seed through whom all the nations will be restored as well. Like Psalm 2 Psalm 8, Psalm 45, Psalm 72. Right. If you all were here with us for our Isaiah sermon series, especially in chapters 9 to 11, we see similar themes of the Davidic king being having universal rule. But if you know your Old Testament, uh, if you don't, yeah, you can take my word for it. This was never realized in Israel's history. Right? Just like Noah, Abraham, and Israel, uh, the Davidic kings, David included, failed as covenant representatives. Right? But the hope of salvation was sustained in their continued lineage. The tension that we spoke about continues. God remains faithfully committed to his promise of a seed through whom he will establish his worldwide kingdom. But no faithful Davidic king appears in Israel's history. Then how? Uh, And this brings us to the New Covenant. So the Old Testament prophets anticipated this New Covenant. Uh, the prophets reflect on the exile right, that they are caused by Israel's faithlessness. So they were sort of brought out of the land by uh, invading armies from the nations. And then they lamented it and they spoke, they predicted a future restoration of God's kingdom ushered in through the new covenant. 
So we're going to read the classic New Covenant text in Jeremiah 31. Uh, so answer this question, what is new about the New Covenant? And what does it tell you about its relationship to the Israelite Covenant? Okay, when you read the text, you'll, you'll talk about the Old Covenant. That refers to the Israelite Covenant. Um, what's new about the New Covenant? Uncle Kaiman? <laughs> oh, you're good. Will be after the days of their ancestors, okay. and they'll put the instruction deep within their hearts. Mm. So they will not need to teach other people. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So there's this like difference in structure. Um, anything else that people saw? Yeah, it will not be broken. Mm. Previous time, Lord, in verse 32, um, the Israelite covenant was the, my covenant that they broke. Mm. Uh, then for the new covenant, this is the covenant that God will make. Mm. And there is no sense of people's obligation. Mm. Okay. So uh, I see three things that um, the new covenant is new in. It's nature, it's structure, and it's sacrifice. Okay, so first the nature. Right. In the Israelite covenant, only a believing remnant like or remainder of the people truly knew God in the Israelite covenant. Israel was made of both true believers and those who did not know God. This is different in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, God writes His law in the heart of every member, as uh, you mentioned. Every member of the New Covenant will know Him. Right. So unlike the mixed community of the Israelite covenant, the entire New Covenant community will know God savingly. There's also a change in structure. Right? Remember, the Israelite covenant had these leadership structures like kingship, like priesthood. Uh, in the, and this is how God related to his people, through the priests, through the kings. In the new covenant, every member will know God. Right? They will directly relate to God. Right? The new covenant raises each member to the same relationship with God. Uh, and this is through the spirit, uh, not here, but in Joel 2, for example. Uh, in addition, the uh, covenant people also expand from Israel to the nations. Not in this text also, but Jeremiah 33 verse 9. <clears throat> so we've seen how there's a radical shift in the nature of the covenant, a radical shift in the structure of the covenant. And this actually achieved through its new sacrifice. Uh, this, not, uh, this hinted in Jeremiah 31, yeah, 31, yeah, uh, where God, was, God says he will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Right. Uh, this unlike the Israelite covenant where everyone died for their own iniquity verse 30 uh, so the logical conclusion is that a better lasting sacrifice is made in the new covenant and is vastly superior to the sheep and goats sacrifice in the Israelite covenant uh, this is explained in the book of Hebrews which we saw in the sermon series last year so to summarize God makes the new covenant with his regenerate maybe surprise you all regenerate people <laughs> Every regenerate new covenant member knows God. Right? In the new covenant, there's no member of the covenant who doesn't know God, unlike the Israelite covenant. It's also a widening of the Israelite covenant. Right? Instead of just relating to uh, the priests and the kings uh, directly, God relates to each member and also of the nations, not just Israel. And perhaps most preciously for us Christians, it is vastly superior to the Israelite covenant because its demands are fully met by God. Its demands are fully met by God, who forgives the sins of his people. And this is why, as Danny mentioned, the new covenant cannot be broken, because God has fully met its demands. Uh, to clarify, it's not that obedience uh, is not needed. Right? The obedience of the new, new covenant people of God spring from our regenerate hearts. Because we've been regenerate, we obey. Okay, that's how the Old Testament ended prophetic anticipation of the new covenant don't worry we are going to speed up when we turn our Bibles to the New Testament fulfillment is all over its pages Old Testament is about promise New Testament is about fulfillment um, maybe Eileen can you read Matthew 1 1 for me sorry did I always choose the wrong place? Matthew 1 1 thanks so there's a genealogy after this right? and Matthew presents Jesus as the true son of David the true seed of Abraham that's yet David, Abraham Matthew, uh, Matthew takes pains to show this through a genealogy right? he saw that he's really from the line of 
Abraham and David. There's an unbroken lineage from these two covenant representatives to Jesus. He's a fulfillment of the Davidic and Abrahamic covenant. Now turn over to Matthew 4, verse 1 to 2. Uh, Agnes, can you read for us? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Alright, thanks. Who was first tempted by the devil? Adam, right, in Genesis 3. But he failed. Who spent 40 nights and 40 days in the wilderness? Uh, 40 years, sorry. Moses. Uh, Moses, uh, Moses was the days. Israel was the years. Right? But they failed. Right? So Matthew presents Jesus as a new Adam and the true Israel. He was able to do what Adam and Israel could not. So you see that Jesus is the promised seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, who will crush the serpent's head. And Jesus uses the language of fulfillment to describe himself as well. Like Matthew 5.17, uh, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill them. Right? The, law of the, pro- the law and the prophets refer to the Old Testament. And Jesus says that he fulfills their promises. It's echoed in 2 Corinthians 1.20, All the promises of God find their yes in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20 so remember earlier we talk, kept talking about this tension between God's commitment to his promises and his covenant partner's inability to obey. Now, this is resolved in Jesus' obedience. God establishes his kingdom through the work of his perfect king, Jesus. The fulfillment of the covenants. And that is in essence the gospel. Right? The gospel is the person and work of Christ. The person of Christ, the perfect king. The work of Christ, life, death and resurrection. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is it true Israel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is it not true Moses? So it's not true Moses because we saw earlier how Moses is not the representative oh. of the oh. Israelite covenant. It's not like Moses had special things to do apart from, I mean, he did, mm-hmm. but he went to lead the people and all that, mm-hmm. but it's not part of the covenant. Right? When, he, when God gave the laws to Israel through Moses, it's not like mm-hmm. Moses had separate things to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's not a representative in that same way. Mm-hmm. He was 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Um, so that is like similar to how Israel was tempted in the wilderness for 40 years and 40, 40 years. Uh, Hosea, uh, was it Hosea 11.1 1 calls um, uh, out of Egypt I caught my son and Matthew applies that to Jesus as well. So he says that like Jesus is the, new, the true Israel. He fulfills the, the um, obligations of the Israelite covenant. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, we know also that um, Jesus did not establish God's kingdom just in his own person. It's not like only Jesus is uh, God's kingdom. Right? If, you, if you saw earlier up the page under New Covenant, I didn't list a representative uh, few. It's because the prophets back then did not know who it would be. But we know that Jesus, the fulfiller of the New Covenant, uh, the fulfiller of all the covenants would also be the representative of the new covenant. Jesus is the representative of the new covenant. Right? And we celebrated that earlier in the Lord's Supper. Right? Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Uh, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup and he had given, them, given thanks. He gave it to them also saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is, he's referring to the new covenant. Luke 22 clarifies this as well. Jesus thus establishes God's kingdom in his people through the new covenant by his blood. So we, the church, as Jesus' followers, are members of the new covenant. We are members of the new covenant. Right? And because the earlier covenants pointed to the new covenant, the church also is related to these earlier covenants. We are members of the new covenant, so we are also a new creation. Right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 We are children of Abraham as well, even though we are not directly in his lineage. Paul calls us that in Galatians 3.29. Children of Abraham. The church, Jew and Gentile, is also together called the Israel of God in Galatians 6.16. Right? Under the new covenant, God establishes his kingdom through his regenerate people, the church. Israel of God. Yeah. Israel of God. 
Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. Since we are running out of time, I'm going to skip the last two questions, though it's probably the most sticky and interesting ones. But we'll summarize instead. Uh, Y'all can ask me about that later if you want. Okay, so in summary, remember how we started this session? The Bible is about how God establishes His kingdom through His covenants. We have traced the different covenants and explained their relationship to one another. We keep looking at how they relate to one another. We have seen how Christ is the fulfillment of the covenants and how we, the church, are members as members of the new covenants also relate to the previous covenants and their promises. Uh, we, as uh, living today, we also know that God's kingdom established work, kingdom establishing work rather, is not done yet. Right? Christ will return to fully consummate the new covenant in the new heavens and the new earth. And until then, we live as faithful members of the new covenant under the ultimate Davidic king, the true Israel, the promised seed of Abraham, the new and better Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's, no, that's now that you have to take, that's just a summary. So, um, it's 12, so let me pray. Um, then there are some reflection questions that y'all can think about in your own time. And I'll just, after I pray, I'll just give a few words about the references and recommendations I gave. Okay, so let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, the Bible, that presents one unified message about how you establish your kingdom through your covenants. Thank you that we are found as members of the new covenant by the blood of your son Jesus that we celebrated earlier in the Lord's Supper. Help us to live faithfully as members of this blessed, unbreakable covenant as we await his return. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.